thing is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. Because now there's a heck of a lot more good competition for those scholarships. We don't stick out as much anymore as we used to. So I'm glad. And that, that's because there's places like you. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be applying for our EU scholarship, and you're probably going to have a good chance of winning one. So, but these are just some of the ways how you can try to track your metrics and so on. And that's kind of the end of it. So, let's see, how long did we do with the rapid fire? Do we have any time for discussion? It's almost 1 30 already. Any thoughts or questions? Yeah. Do you, so, how many, uh, or if at all, how many undergraduate classes that you, do you have that are specifically railway? Specifically railway. We have a. Um, uh, we have right now. We only have, we have two undergraduate <coughs> classes. We have the basic railroad engineering, and uh, then we have a, just a one grade railway seminar. Then we have one class which is track design and engineering. It's a graduate level class, but our seniors that can take grad level classes and vice versa. Because we don't have such a big graduate student body, so we got to do a lot of mixing and matching. And then we also have public transit planning and engineering graduate level course, which is the same way. So we have four classes that have very high rail, I mean, are either specific for rail or have high rail content. And then we also now, in the business school, we just started transportation logistics and management course. You know, that has kind of really called. And um, why you said that rail, uh, railroad uh, industry prefers undergraduates? Is that because there's so much training involved for someone to get up to speed or like so much required training? There's a few reasons. Yeah, training is one of the aspects. But the other thing is graduate students are fairly technically trained and fairly high. And you know, most of the hires that go to these road master positions, they're not very engineering heavy positions. They're management heavy positions. You're managing people, you're managing budgets, and so on. So you don't necessarily get to use all the graduate level skills. So you know, they've just kind of found that you know, for these basic management training program positions, the undergraduates are just a much better fit. And I don't necessarily disagree on that. It's not, I mean, they do get graduate students for those positions sometimes too, but that's really the graduate student who is interested in taking that route. And the other thing is that they, they need numbers. They need a lot of people. You know, it's tough to find graduate students, enough graduate students who, who would be taking those. So tell us a little bit about the track well, that's an interesting question. Um, so the rail network has been shrinking for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. There's right. been less track miles in the United States. I think we are kind of in the turning point, just like we did with the employment. The employment went down for six, six decades, and only now it's actually started inching up. The same thing with the track. All the track that wasn't used has been shed, shed away. But now there's all these new development, like mines and crude oils and all the other things that, for the first time for ages, there's, there's really need for some new mines. But I think the main trunk line, it's still the most construction is actually on the existing tracks. It's just expanding the existing infrastructure on the lines, you know, instead of having single track, putting double track instead of having double track or triple track. Because the main veins of the nation are still the same. You may get these little kind of spikes building back the spider web that was taken away at specific locations. But railroads are pretty um, conservative in building new track structure because you put it there, it's there for 50 years. And the business has changed much faster these days. So you really got to convince them pretty heavily with the return of investment so that they build a new new line. But the main trunk lines, you know, between east and west and north and south, I mean, those are always gonna stay as the main corridors. So they are expanding those as much as they can. I don't really have the numbers of how much yeah. miles have increased though. So the other one is sort of the the intermodal stuff, you know, like um, was in Indiana the Indianapolis and they were just so excited about you know, getting a small intermodal station there. And then there's one that if you go to the Wisconsin Rail uh, meeting or something, they're all, so we have one intermodal facility in Wisconsin. It's just in Chippewa Falls. And it's 
I mean, literally, it's just like a parking lot with the rail, and they're just all woo about it. So, what? What's? So, I mean, the significance of having an intermodal facility and um, the kind of a trend on, on that, and, and really, then the it doesn't really require it doesn't seem to require that much infrastructure. No, it, it really doesn't at the basic level. It really doesn't. Um, and, you know, I'm not really an expert when it comes to logistics and operations. I'm trying to learn those like crazy because we have a lot of projects. But I'm a civil engineer. I used to design yeah. tracks, so I'm kind of learning this operations side. But I think the really interesting about thing about this whole intermodal thing is, is once again, is the change of opinions and the change of the, of the business attitude. Because if you asked five years ago the railroad companies and you said that, you know what, I predict that in five years we're going to be building an intermodal terminal that has 25,000 lifts and that exists on a short line railroad, everybody would think you're nuts. Yeah. Because all they were concentrating on were building these humongous intermodal terminals in Chicago or other places with at least half a million, <coughs> half a million lifts per year. That was all they said. And they said that we only need intermodal terminal every thousand miles, then we truck the rest of it. Times change very quick. Five years later, we have Tipova Force, we have Indiana. One, and I really think that's going to be the big expansion, not only the intermodal, the container traffic, but also the transload facility, which means the more the bulk transloads. Whether it's a agri uh, agriculture, or whether it's a, it's a um, frac sand, or whether it's a combination of different commodities that, that gets transferred in one small lo location. I really think that's both those sites. It's, it's been all about you know concentrating on these big loads and big numbers. Now it's going to be all about how do we get more business from these more light density areas. We've already captured all the business from the major areas. So I think, and I think Richard's story is actually writing a paper to your uh, golf board meeting in February about some of these changes. I just told the thing about that. I got to review this paper. But I, I think on the era, the trend is really, it, it really is changing. But the, this is the interesting thing is that, you know, life turns around so much quicker now, all this world turns around so much quicker. We think about how long like an agricultural in, uh, age took and how long did the industrial age take and how long did this, you know, whatever the next internet age take. Everything is just shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. So it's really challenging for transportation infrastructure because we can't really build anymore for 50 years. You gotta be flexible now. Because you may have frac sand today, and you're building all these facilities for frac sand. Well, guess what? That may be over in four years. Because the energy price went down, they found something even better or whatever. So what do you do with the facility? You've got to be able to use it for something else. So I think flexibility is going to be the big thing. I'd love to learn more about it. Let's need to find time. I have a question. Uh, ASC does a great number of infrastructure, and as a whole, America's Pretty lousy around the D range, the train and the rail system is no different. And uh, rail system actually got better. A little, right? Yeah, but, a little it, but we're still not in the A good range at all. Yeah. So, what is the plan for like I guess infrastructure management? Because it's different than roads where there's a lot more private funding necessary rather than public funding in order right. to do the upgrades. Because there's still a lot of wooden bridges that exist for rail bridges right. and things like that. What is the plan, I guess, in the future for transition to either steel or concrete? structures to, I guess, as, as this industry increases in volume of traffic, I'm sure that the demand for improved infrastructure also increases, <coughs> just absolutely sustain that type of volume. Yeah. The, the good news is that when you look at the, you know, the, the road infrastructure, when you look at the grades, the grades are going up. The rail infrastructure, the grades are actually going up, slowly, but they're going up. I mean, they used to be backwards. I mean, rail is in very good position because they, the infrastructure is better now than it was five or ten years ago. And they have money to keep investing on. Now, I don't think the railroads want to get level A because they move freight, and freight does not need level A. Freight only needs level B or C. Their biggest thing is that I want to have infrastructure that does not break down. That is the key thing. So you'll see their concentration is going to be in, like you said, changing the structures that have a risk of failure. And also their second thing is going to be in 
creating more and more methods that they can do preventively all the changes. But when one major line goes down for one hour, it's a million dollars when the train traffic stops. A million dollars per hour for some of the key lines. So you can only imagine if it goes down for 24 hours that you just wasted 24 million dollars. You can almost replace a bridge for that price. So I think they, it's still going to be selective. They're pumping a lot of money to the infrastructure and to the capacity. But it's still going to be selective on where is our biggest risk. Let's only take care of the biggest risk and stuff. The other thing that uh, is changing is the main attention has been in the, in the so-called superstructure. The ballast, the rail, the ties and all that stuff. Those are starting to be in pretty good shape. So now they're starting to pay attention to what's happening under the ballast. In the past, they didn't. They just kept dumping ballast. But now they're starting to look, hey, you know, how can we really improve this substructure? So those are my couple of crystal balls for them. All right. Well, do they intend to pursue federal funding for like any of this infrastructure? Is it strictly going to be private for the majority because it's a private? Only four lines where there might be passenger trains coming, then they would definitely pursue federal funding. Or if they, it's some kind of you know new intermodal corridor where they do these PPPs, but. Even then, I don't think they would look for the basic infrastructure. They would look for like a building a new facility or something. Okay. Thank you. So when you first put together the program and you started introducing rail, um, course opportunities for undergraduates, did you start with a few lectures in basic transportation course, or did you go right to having a uh, I don't know, it's a free credit, credit course or what? Is it? Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, that was, a, that was another really kind of unique way because I was a PhD student, so we couldn't really go the regular route. I can, it would have been pretty hard, tough to, uh, you know, tell the university we're going to offer a course taught by PhD students, a brand new one. So we actually went through this. That was one of the reasons we did an international summer program. We were able to bypass all that administrative crap and uh, able to actually pay for it. So yes, we build a full course right away off the bat and I would just market it on the existing courses but it was a special program because it was a summer program and we also included cultural parts and so on and only you know a couple of years after that and we added another course and a few years after that we added another course and we still you know we, we are kind of we can't really have more courses than we have right now our structure of the student schedule is such that they have so few you know, technical electives that even if I had five or six courses, I, I just don't have a student body. So, <coughs> the students That's so really funny that you're very right? Sorry? That's so funny that you're very right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, um, the students who do take those, the rail engineering courses, do they tend to be like the structures, the geotechs? That's a great point. I forgot yeah. to mention that. Um, so one of the things, when we started our program, I was pretty adamant that if we want to build a sustainable rail program, it needs to be multidisciplinary because it's such a niche area. You don't have enough volume in one single discipline. So we started, first of all, not under any single department. We started under Michigan Tech Transportation Institute. So I don't know, you know, if you guys have, well, I can see by kind of something. So I don't know what you have here, but that to a certain degree, allowed us to market it around the campus and not say that this is a civil engineering program or civil engineering initiative, but this is a transportation issue. So it, it helps a little bit breaking some of the academic barriers. Um, we do get about, if I look at recruitment, half of our students get rec recruited from civil department. The other half is a mixture of electrical, mechanical, construction management and business. And then few funny ones maybe from chemical or something. So environment, but those are that's kind of the breakdown. Our basic class is now a free elective for mechanical engineers. So I suddenly got this big group of mechanicals coming to my class. We have now this time I have 24 students and I have like 10 mechanicals, 13 civils and a couple of you know people who really want to take. So that's one of my things. You know, even Arima is engineering. Don't restrict. It. You, anybody who get, you know, you have the history guy here. Tell them, come on, political science, come on, business, come on, doesn't matter. Try to build as versatile group as you can. 
we encourage anybody to come, and I'll tell you, the railroads are hiring a lot of train masters for our business. So uh, it's not all about engineering. Plus, it keeps you, if you get the student business students involved, it gives you much better, you know, chance to kind of see the business side of things. Another thing, we do a lot of student process. I'm a big believer on those. We do uh, externally funded uh, undergraduate senior design and so called enterprise projects. So. <coughs> through the National University the Rail Center, we've been able to fund some projects internally and then we match. So we are funding projects where we fund half of it and industry funds the other half of it. But that's been able to me to get, you know, we're doing right now a project with mechanical engineering, looking to send upon center pin rail cars. We're doing one with the electrical engineering looking to create crossing chopper cables. We are doing one with wireless students, computer, electrical engineering, and business students, we're doing a market study for this 10 company looking into these so-called balises, and we're doing a civil construction management study on great crossing surfaces for them. So that's another good you know, way how we're trying to get these different students to work with each other and interdisciplinary. We did we redesigned the coupler of rail car. We had both materials and mechanical students. So try to spread as wide as you can. Yeah, nice. How do you, as a university, try to get this program out? Because it is a very much a, I guess, a niche of a program where there's not a lot of universities even offer this. Mm -hmm. and